In the section on level curves, level surfaces, level sets, we used in a strong way the implicit function theorem, uh, yeah, the implicit function theorem um, to know that at a point on a level set where the gradient of the defining function is not zero, the gradient vector of the defining function is not zero, that the level set was smooth and the, the, the tangent vectors were exactly those vectors that were perpendicular to the gradient vector. Um, it should have been unclear why the, the theorem that we use there is called the implicit function theorem. We never actually see that there's <laughs> something that's implicitly a function of something else. Um, it is the implicit function theorem. It's just, uh, it's just you use a part of it. It doesn't make that so clear. In this section of the book, we want to look at the implicit function theorem again, look at implicitly defined functions, and actually look at implicit differentiation. This is a topic you should remember that you did in calculus one, um, so in one variable calculus, if, um, if you had a level surface and you wanted to implicitly define, uh, see that one variable was implicitly defined in terms of the other one, and then you'd have a single variable function, which is why you can handle it in single variable calculus. Um, we'll st actually start out with kind of a single variable example, and, uh, and then but with an eye towards the multivariable case, and then I'll state the theorem, and then we'll look at a more complicated example. So, um, implicit differentiation, well, a, a typical problem, so probably the easiest example that's still complicated enough to show you what's going on. Suppose I take the function of two variables, f of xy equals x squared plus y squared. So if you look at level sets of this, there'll be level curves, provided that you look at where the value of this is positive. We'll go ahead and fix that, consider the level curve where f is 1. At, i.e., the circle. Given by x squared plus y squared equals 1. All right, and the question is, in what sense does this equation define y implicitly as a function of x, and if it does define y implicitly as a function of x, what's the derivative of y with respect to x? So those are the questions. So in what sense does x squared plus y squared is 1, define y as a function of x. And if it does, <laughs> if it does define it as a function of x in some way, what? dy dx. So this is a multivariable function, uh, f of xy equals x squared plus y squared. This is, a, this is an ordinary derivative, but since we want to look ahead to more variables, you could think, oh, what's the partial derivative of y with respect to x? That doesn't hurt if you think of it that way. If a, if a function only depends on one variable, its partial derivative and its ordinary derivative are the same. Okay, so what's the problem here? Well, you should know that x squared plus y squared equals 1 is a, a circle of radius 1 centered at the origin, and this is not the graph of a function. Right? This is not the graph of a function. Why not? Well, what's usually said is it doesn't pass a vertical line test. 
which is just a graphical way of saying that for a given x value, there could be more than one y value, like a, a vertical line here hits the graph twice. And the point is that means for that x value, there are two corresponding y values, but a function is supposed to give you back one y value. So this is not the graph of a function. So, oh no, this doesn't define y as a function of x. But we can almost solve this for y as a function of x. As you should know, if you put the x squared on the right, and take square roots, but put in a plus or minus, you get y is plus or minus one minus the square, uh, the square root of one minus x squared, which is why you get two y values sometimes because of the plus or minus. So really, there are two functions here, two functions. There's y is the positive square root of 1 minus x squared, and y equals negative the square root of 1 minus x squared. And of course, the graphs of those, with the plus one, you get the top half of the circle, including the endpoints. And that's the graph of a function. It passes a vertical line test. And then there's, you get the bottom half, including these overlapping two points on the x-axis. And that's the graph of a function. Um, great, so what you can see immediately is that, oh, well, if, if you're near a point, so suppose you're, you're near this point, well, then there's only one function that we're interested in that corresponds to this equation. So if you're, because the y is positive here, here you would want to choose, oh, yeah, the function I care about is y equals the positive square root of 1 minus x squared. On the other hand, if your y coordinate were negative, then, yeah, then this equation implicitly defines y as a function of x, but it would be y is negative the square root of 1 minus x squared. So... Yes, this equation does not define y as a function of x um, globally, but if you also know that y is positive or y is negative, then this implicitly defines y as a function of x. On the top half, you would pick this, this function. On the bottom half, you would pick this function. Okay. Um, what about the derivatives? Well, of course, we can calculate the derivatives of these functions, and I'm going to. Then I'm going to write them in a nice way so that we can see that you can actually get the derivative of y with respect to x in either case easily from this equation without ever having to solve explicitly for y. So I want to do that so that we can see the kind of formulas we're headed towards. So suppose y equals the square root of 1 minus x squared. Ah, there's one thing I should have said before I do this. Um, before I go on, I, I should have said that you should notice there's a problem at two points. There are two points where there's no hope of using this equation to implicitly define y as a function of x. Namely, this point and this point, the two points where y is 0. Because when y is 0, anywhere near here, well, you can't, you can't, there's no way to decide, oh, do you mean the top half or the bottom half? This equation doesn't implicitly define y as a function of x in a neighborhood of these points because there's always going to be this top piece that comes down to it and this bottom piece that goes into it, and then it's not the graph of a function. So you kind of expect that there are some problem points, and we'll see why. All right. Meanwhile, back at, so suppose y is the square root of 1 minus x squared, so that um, we're assuming y is greater than or equal to 0. In fact, we're going to want y is unequal to 0, but we'll see that in a second. Anyway, I mean, we don't want those blue points that I just indicated, but if you had this, well, this is, 1 minus x squared to the 1 half. 
and its derivative, dy dx, is 1 half times 1 minus x squared to minus 1 half times minus 2x. The 2's cancel, you're left with minus x, and then 1 minus x squared to the minus 1 half is 1 over 1 minus x squared to the positive 1 half, which is 1 over the square root of 1 minus x squared. And if you want, that denominator is exactly the function we started with. We get minus x over y. Well, of course, you can't have y be 0 here, so we need for this to be pos strictly positive. So, <clears throat> so, which means we're not at one of the point, the blue points I indicated on the x-axis. Suppose y, suppose we're on the bottom half, though. So, suppose y is negative the square root of 1 minus x squared. So that's negative 1 minus x squared to the 1 half. Well, of course, you're going to get negative the derivative. So then dy dx is, well, is going to be negative this. So we're going to get x over the square root of 1 minus x squared. But <laughs> if we get tricky and put, a, put the minus sign back there and put one there, then that denominator with the minus is exactly y in this, for this function. And once again, you get minus x over y. So if you're happy writing a formula for the derivative involving x and y instead of just x, then you can have one formula that works on the top half or the bottom half, but they don't work when y is 0. Namely, you get dy dx equals minus x over y. Um, so this is the kind of thing we're after more generally. We would like to know when does, um, when does an equation of the form some function of any number of variables equals a constant, when can we at least in theory solve for one of the variables in terms of the other, in terms of the other variables, at least near certain points? We don't expect to have a global solution because maybe, maybe the graph doesn't pass a vertical line test. But if we're near a point, um, can we say that, ah, yes, the given equation, at least in theory, so that can we say there exists a function, so that y is that function of x near a point? And if there is such a function, can we find nice formulas for the derivatives? Um, in terms of all the variables, but without explicitly having to solve for y, can we do it just using the initial equation? The yeah, initial kind of equation that's implicitly defining the function. This is what the implicit function theorem is for and what implicit differentiation means. So let me state the theorem. <coughs> and now we'll be, we'll have any number of variables. So, The theorem, so the implicit function theorem. I won't prove this, but it's proved, or at least the proof is sketched. It's a very serious sketch of it in the more depth section. Um, it, it uses, it's almost entirely the inverse function theorem. You set yourself, you be clever and set yourself up use the inverse function theorem to prove the implicit function theorem. But, all right, so suppose, um, suppose that f, which is a function of, it's all right, f equals f of x1 through xn is continuously differentiable on an open neighborhood of a point P and that, well, we want that the gradient vector of F at P is not zero, 
which means one of the partial derivatives is not zero, and I want to specify that partial derivative, which one it is. Um, I'm going to open the of P, and that. Um, the partial derivative of f with respect to xi evaluated at p is not zero. So I'm picking a coordinate. The typical assumption is the gradient vector of f is not zero at p, but that means one of the partial derivatives is not zero at p, and I need to actually look at a coordinate where that happens. Then there exists. an open neighborhood of P, a, a conceivably smaller one. And I'll give this one a name. Open neighborhood U of P and a continuously differentiable function Um, a function of the other x's, so not this one, and a function, so it's a little hard to write. I'll write g is g of x sub 1, and then you go out to, we want to leave out x sub i, so I'll go out to x sub i minus 1, and x sub i plus 1, and then go out to x n. So the point is, it's a function of all the other variables except x i. Um, such that such that what? This is the big deal. Such that we're all we're all x, so x is an intuple of the x-coordinates, it's in, in, in u, this open neighborhood of p, f of x equals f of p, so that all this says is that x is a point on the level set of f that passes through p, if and only if x sub i equals g of the other x variables. There's a furthermore, but before I say the, the furthermore, I want to say, I want to explain maybe in more down-to-earth terms what this means. All this is saying is that as long as the partial derivative of f with respect to i is non-zero at p, then if you take this equation, that f of x, your function f of x equals this constant, whatever f of p is, um, that this equation implicitly defines xi in terms of the other variables. That, because there is this function g, and it says that, oh, um, Yes, xi can be written as a function of the other variables under those conditions. So theoretically, you can solve for xi. Um, in practice, we never find explicitly this function of g. That's why it's called you know, the implicit function theorem and why you differentiate implicitly. You actually never produce this, this function g. Um, and I say this function, the g is unique at least. So this is unique. There's only one. Um, it really, any two, if you had another one, they'd have to agree on some possibly smaller open neighborhood of P, but they're, so it's essentially unique. Uh, but the furthermore is how you differentiate furthermore. So now that G is a function of these independent variables, and we're saying XI equals G, we can ask for the partial derivative of xi with respect to xj, where j is not 
the same as i. So with respect to these other variables, so furthermore, for j unequal to i, so you pick some variable that's not x sub i, we'd like a formula for the derivative of g with respect to the x's, or so the derivative of xi with respect to the other variables. So it's the same as the partial derivative of g with respect to xj. And what we want is a formula in terms of f, because as I've said, we don't want to explicitly solve for g. And the formula is very nice. You get this minus sign, and you get the partial derivative of f with respect to xj, and it's divided by the partial derivative of f with respect to xi. Now, this could be somewhat hard to remember. Um, in a sense, the proof might help you remember, but you, the proof is involved enough that it might be confusing. You get this from the chain rule, the multivariable chain rule. It's not terribly difficult. Actually, it's relatively easy from the chain rule, but there's a confusing, slightly confusing part. Um, how can you remember this formula? Well, you should remember that you want partial derivatives of f. It's going to involve partials with respect to xi and xj. The minus sign, just try to remember. How do you remember which one goes in the numerator and which one goes in the denominator? You're dividing by the partial of f with respect to xi. This is the partial derivative that is you're assuming is not zero at p, so you know you can divide by it at p, but since f is continuously differentiable, if it's not, um, the partial derivatives are continuous, if it's not zero at p, then it's not zero in a small neighborhood of p, so that in some open neighborhood of p, this denominator is never zero, so you can always do this division. All right, this is kind of the real implicit function theorem. Um, and I want to go back to the example of the circle and show that it gives us the formulas that we got, negative, or the formula, minus x over y. And then I want to do a more complicated example, and then that will be that. Um, so let's return to our simple example. Of the circle of radius 1, centered at the origin. So let's go back to example. So come back to f of xy is x squared plus y squared. And we're looking at f of xy equals 1. And we'd like to know, so this is x squared plus y squared equals 1. And we would like to know where the implicit function theorem tells us that this implicitly defines y as a function of x. And at those points, we'd like to have a formula for the, for the partial derivative of y with respect to x, which is the same as the ordinary derivative, because y would only be, would be a function of just x. So what we need the gradient vector of f, the gradient of f is 2x. Uh, actually, let me, if we're trying to solve it implicitly for y as a function of x, then all we want is the partial of f. It's true, we only want to do this at points where the gradient vector is non-zero. But if we've decided we don't want to solve for x in terms of y, we know we want to solve for y in terms of x, there's no reason to calculate the entire gradient vector. We just want to know that this partial derivative is not 0 at p, at the point where we want to do this. So the partial derivative of f with respect to y is 2y. And so this will be non-zero any place that y is non-zero. So this is unequal to 0 if y is unequal to 0. So that the implicit function theorem tells us that yes, at least near a point where y is not 0, a point on this level curve, where y is not 0, um, we can implicitly solve for y in terms of x because this partial derivative is not 0. Well, that's what we found before. As long as y wasn't 0, as long as we weren't at those two points on the x-axis, we could solve for y um, if we knew whether y was positive or negative, which would be determined by what point we were at. Great. So yes, 
This means we can solve for y. So this tells us you can solve f of x, y equals 1 implicitly or you can solve it. In theory, you can solve it. And I'm saying you can solve implicitly, meaning you just tell yourself you, y is a function of x. You can solve implicitly for y in terms of x. So maybe I should say in theory instead of implicitly. If you actually do it, it's not implicit anymore. So you can solve for y in terms of in theory for y in terms of x near any point on, on the level curve. So it has to be on the level curve. But you need where y is unequal to 0. As I said, this is what we saw before. Great. And, OK, then what is dy dx? If we do let y be the function that's implicitly defined in terms of x, well, it's the same as the partial derivative of y with respect to x. And according to the formula I wrote before, this should be negative, the partial derivative of f with respect to x over the partial derivative of f with respect to y. Right? That variable matches that one, and this one matches this one. Um, so what do we get? You get negative the partial derivative of f with respect to x, 2x, partial derivative of f with respect to y, 2y. You can cancel the 2's. You get negative x over y, which is what we got before, or when we actually solved explicitly for y in terms of x, given that y was positive or negative. Notice that to actually calculate this derivative from this formula, you will need to be given not just the value of x, but also the value of y. That's a reflection of the fact that globally, you can't solve for y in terms of x. And so you can't just be given x, because that doesn't determine the y value, so it wouldn't determine the derivative. So, um, so you need to be given the xy pair. All right, um, let's do a, let's look at a, a more complicated example, but <coughs> really, if you understand the implicit function theorem in that easier example, you probably will have no trouble with it here. But let's look at one more complicated example. So example, um, show that near x, y, z equals 1, 0, e, the equation Two z plus x y e to the y minus z ln of natural log of z over x equals e show that that equation. Well, there are three parts. A implicitly defines. as a function of y and z. And you should calculate um, the partial derivative of x with respect to y and the partial derivative of x with respect to z. All right, so that's the first part. Second part, oh, we can say that, oh, it also implicitly defines, 
y as a function of x and z and find the partial derivatives. The partial derivative of y with respect to x and the partial derivative of y with respect to z. And c does not implicitly define z as a function of x and y. At least not as far as at least as far as being able to use the implicit function theorem to conclude it. Um, it's conceivable that while the hypotheses of the implicit function theorem aren't satisfied that somehow you can solve for z here in terms of x and y. Conceivable. But we really mean here that the implicit function theorem doesn't tell us that we can. All right. Well, before we do these parts of the problem, I, I should say that notice that algebraically you have essentially no hope <laughs> of solving for any of these explicitly because of this x being here and here. There's no good way to solve for x in terms of y and z because there's a, a y here and up there. There's no good way to solve for y because there's a z there, there, and there. There's no easy way to solve for z in terms of x and y. Um, and, but the implicit function theorem applies and tells us, will tell this, will tell us that, oh yes, x in fact is a function of y and z near this point, and y is a function of x and z, so there exist you know, functions. Um, there's also one thing that you're not told to do in this problem, but you should probably do it anyway, if for no other reason than if you're taking a test and you're asked this kind of question and you check what I'm about to check and it doesn't work out, then you should raise your hand or write on a test, aha, you made a mistake, I don't have to do this problem. You should actually check at this point, right, we need to apply the implicit function theorem at a point that's on the level set in question. We need for this point to satisfy this equation. And while we're not explicitly told to do that, and it would be a trick question if it weren't true, it's a good thing to check anyway. So um, I'm going to check that. Do you really have to? Well, I suppose not. You should just assume that the question's written correctly, but. It's easy to check, and seriously, if you're taking a test or even doing a homework problem, and just want to make sure you've written it down correctly, the book's written it correctly, um, or the, the test has been composed correctly, you might want to check this. So our equation, so I'm going to let g, so I'm going to give our function a name, let g equal uh, 2z plus xy e to the y e to the y minus z ln natural log of z over x. All right. I'd like to look at g of the point that we're looking at, 1, 0, e, just to verify that that point is on the level set where this equals e. Um, you plug that in. Uh, z is e, so this is 2e. y is 0, so this is plus 0 times, who cares what it's times, minus e times the natural log of e over 1. The natural log of e is 1, so we get 2e minus e, yes, we get e. So yes, this point is on the level set where g equals e. All right, let's, to apply the implicit function theorem, we need to know that the partial derivative that we're interested of, if we're trying to show one variable as a function of the others, we need to show the partial derivative of g with respect to that one variable is not zero at the point. So that's going to be true, since, we're try since you're told to solve for x in terms of y and z, it better be that the partial derivative of g with respect to x is not zero at this point. It also better be, because of part b, it better be true that the partial derivative of g with respect to y at 1, 0, e is not 0 
And part C should mean that the partial derivative of g with respect to z is zero at the point one zero e so that we can't apply the implicit function theorem. But let's check these partial derivatives. Partial derivative of g with respect to x, all right, zero here. Uh, with respect to x here, we get y e to the y. With respect to x here, oh, well, you could write this out. In fact, it would probably be nice to go ahead and have this throughout the problem. We can use properties of logs and write this as, this is the natural log of z minus the natural log of x. So we get minus z natural log of z plus z times the natural log of x. So uh, that's a little easier to take the partial derivatives with respect to. Partial derivative with respect to x, we get a y e to the y, and then here you get a plus z over x. Um, we want this, well, maybe I'll evaluate them all at the point in a minute. No, I'll go ahead and do it. So let me call this point P, just for notational ease. So if I evaluate this partial derivative at P, all right, that means I'm putting in x is 1, y is 0, and z is e. If y is 1, uh, sorry, y is 0, so we get 0 plus z is e, um, x is 1, so we get e. Okay, so that's not 0. The partial derivative of g with respect to x at the point in question is not 0, so the implicit function theorem tells us, in fact, that this equation, uh, it's not here, but the equation g equals e, so this function equals e, does implicitly define x as a function of y and z near this point. Uh, the partial of g with respect to y. All right, partial of g with respect to y. The x goes along from the ride, but we need to do the power rule here, uh, the product rule here. It's x times the first thing times the derivative of the second plus x times the same thing times the derivative of the first, so we get this. Um, and that's it. That's the only part that depends on y. You evaluate at p. Evaluate at p. So you plug in, again, y is 0, so that's 0. Uh, you get 1, and x is 1, so here you get 1. Again, this is not 0. So yes, we can solve the equation g, g of x, y, z equals e, we can solve it. I mean, we know there's a solution um, for, for y as a function of x and z near this point. So yes, it, the equation g of x, y, z equals e implicitly defines y as a function of x and z. And finally, I'll try to cram it in right here, the partial of g with respect to z is, all right, we get a 2. And then no z's. Here you need to do the product rule, so you get a minus. And then it's the first thing times the derivative of the second, plus the second thing times the derivative of the first. And then you also get a, partial, a plus ln of x. If we evaluate at p, What do we get? Uh, well, I've said we get zero, but let's see. You plug in, uh, y doesn't appear in here anywhere, so that's irrelevant. X is one, and z is e. So we get, all right, well this is one. Z is e, so we get, we get two minus one plus one. Right, this is one. If z is e, this is 1, 2 minus 2, and then plus the ln of x, but x is 1. So plus the natural log of 1, but that's 0. So yes, we do get 0. So what does this tell us? It tells us we cannot use the implicit function theorem to say that the equation g of x, y, z equals e defines z implicitly as a function of y and z. So that's part c that you that you can't do this, at least by applying the implicit function theorem. Um, and parts A and B, we check. Those, the corresponding partial derivatives 
partial of g with respect to x is not zero at that point. So yes, this equation implicitly defines x as a function of y and z. And this, this equation implicitly defines y as a function of x and z because the partial derivative of this is not y. It's not zero at this point. And then we want the formulas for the partial derivatives, but those are easy. Let me, let me write them. Maybe I'll just do the ones for part A, the ones for part B, or, well, no, I'll do both. So <clears throat> um, we want the partial derivative of x with respect to y. Our formula for this was that you get negative, the partial derivative of, I wrote f before, but now our function is g, the partial derivative of g with respect to y, divided by the partial derivative of g with respect to x, right? This is, right, when we're doing this part, this is the part where the partial derivative of g with respect to x is not zero, so it's all right for it to be in the denominator. Um, you have the negative sign, you have the partial with respect to the other variable. Well, we calculated these partial derivatives over there, so you, now you can, without just plugging in p, so now you can just plug in what we calculated. If I can read it, we get x, y, e to the y, x, y, e to the y plus x, e to the y. Put this minus sign floating out in front. So the partial derivative of g with respect to y we found was x times y times e to the y plus x times e to the y. And the partial derivative of g with respect to x was y e to the y plus z over x. Right, y e to the y plus z over x. So you get this for the partial of x with respect to y. What's the partial derivative of x with respect to z? Well, you just get negative. You get negative partial derivative of g with respect to z, and it's divided by the same thing, the partial derivative of g with respect to x. So again, we get this negative sign. You get the same denominator. Um, minus sign. And then we have to read off our previous calculation, the partial derivative of g with respect to x, which, uh, with respect to z, which was 2 minus 1 plus ln of z plus the ln of x. Uh, did I read that correctly? 2 minus 1 plus ln of z plus ln of x. Right. So, these are the formulas you get. Yes, they're unattractive, but they were easy, right? We just had to calculate some partial derivatives and divide. We never solve for x explicitly in terms of y and z, and we can't. But if you're given a point x, y, and z that satisfies this equation, um, um, then you can plug those in here and calculate these partial derivatives. Uh, all right, let's do, let's finish part B. Um, I want to keep this. In part B, we were solving for y in terms of x and z. We saw that we could do that because the partial derivative of g with respect to y is not zero at the point in question. So the question is, what do we get for the partial derivative of y with respect to x and the partial derivative of y with respect to z? It's the same type of formula, you get negative the partial derivative of f with respect to x divided by the partial derivative of f with respect to y. And now we're in the case where we're solving for y in terms of x and z, or thinking that we implicitly, so there is a function, there exists a function um, y, there exists a function g so that y equals g of xz, and that means that we're using the implicit function theorem, so we're assuming the partial derivative of, ah, when did I switch from, uh, I didn't do it over there. Yes, our function is called g, not f. So let me 
change those to G's. And yeah, we we're finding we're, we know in this case, we're, when we're saying y is implicitly defined in terms of x and z, that the partial of g with respect to y is not zero. So it's all right for it to be in the denominator. And then you just read off our partial derivative calculations with, so you get minus y e to the y plus z over x divided by the partial derivative of g with respect to y, which is x y e to the y plus x e to the y. And the partial derivative of y with respect to z minus the partial derivative of g with respect to z divided by the partial derivative of g with respect to y. And that is negative. The partial of g with respect to z, this thing, so negative, we get 2 minus 1 plus the natural log of z plus the natural log of x all divided by the same denominator we had up here, partial derivative of g with respect to y, x e to the y, uh, x y e to the y plus x e to the y. Yeah, again, the formulas are not <laughs> pretty, but you wouldn't succeed in solving for y explicitly in terms of x and z. So you should think of these as nice formulas because yeah, they're a little ugly to calculate, but at least it's doable in a reasonably short amount of time. And again, your answers come out in terms of x, y, and z. You know, ideally, you could just take x and you're, you're asserting that there exists, that y is a function of x and z. So in, in theory, if you just gave x and z, um, you could produce the y. Well, that's true. There is only one y that corresponds to that x and z near the point. 1, 0, e, but <clears throat> um, because we can't explicitly solve for y as a function of x and z, given the x and z, it's usually kind of impossible. They'd have to be very special for you to produce the corresponding y value. So typically, you'd be given x, y, and z to plug into these, and then you plug them in, and you get what you get. That is the implicit function theorem and how you differentiate implicitly in multivariable calculus. It's, um, it's a handy thing to do when you really can't solve explicitly for one variable in terms of the others.